Good morning. Uh, Would you turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1? Colossians chapter 1. We are going to study a wonderful passage this morning, verses 12 through 14. But I'll begin reading at verse 9 to give us the context of where we picked up from last time. So I'll read Colossians 1, starting at verse 9. This is the word of God. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Well, let me remind us of the context of this passage of the letter of Paul's to the Colossians. The believers at Colossae had encountered a false teaching, a heresy. And this false teaching was subtle. It did not openly reject Jesus and his work But it taught that to live a really spiritual life, to really be accepted by God, you needed Christ plus. You needed Christ and ceremonial Jewish laws. You needed Christ plus asceticism. Well, what's that? Asceticism is the forsaking of good things, good gifts that God has given for the purpose of spiritual growth. You needed Christ and that to be accepted. You needed Christ and you needed to worship angels was part of this teaching. And you needed Christ plus external and outward things. And Paul writes to these Colossians and he strongly argues for the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. That's what Colossians is all about. Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done is enough. He is sufficient for Christians. And Paul begins to plant seeds for this argument that Christ is supreme and he is sufficient already in our letter. If you remember, we looked at verses 3 through 8 in chapter 1, and we saw that Paul thanked God for the work of the gospel in the lives of the Colossians. The true gospel produces faith and it produces love. That's the mark of the true gospel in opposition to this false teaching. And also, Paul mentions that this gospel, this true message, was delivered by Epaphras, who he calls a faithful minister. He is the one who brought faithfully the message, no more and no less. And we also saw in our last sermon in Colossians, in verses 9 through 12, Paul shares some of his prayer requests for the Colossians. And the second prayer request was that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. The gospel produces good works in those whom it reaches. And we looked at four characteristics of a Christian who walks in a manner worthy of the Lord last time. Uh, For example, they do good works, they know God better, they increase in the knowledge of God, they are strengthened with power to endure and to have patience, And the fourth point was that they give thanks to the Father. A true Christian is one who is a thankful Christian, who gives thanks to the Father. And our passage today, verses 12 through 14, is really connected to that point, giving thanks to the Father. And our outline this morning, or before I get to our outline, our theme, our thesis, if I could say the sermon in one sentence, it is this. God has sovereignly delivered Christians from darkness into light. God has sovereignly delivered Christians from darkness into light. And so our outline will be three points this morning. It will be, first of all, the Christian's dark past. Secondly, the Christian's bright present. And thirdly, 
the Christian's brilliant future. And we will begin in the darkness this morning in our first point, and we will get brighter and lighter and lighter as we go. Paul uses this analogy of darkness and light to illustrate salvation, how we have been saved. And in my mind, it's much like a sunrise. Uh, Maybe you've gotten up really early somewhere to go see the sunrise. Maybe you can think of that in your mind. I can remember a few years ago, I was going up to the top of Mount Whitney, and I decided I wanted to get to the very top to see the sunrise. It's a common thing people do. And I hiked up in the middle of the night, I got up there, and I had grossly miscalculated what time the sun would come up. And I ended up sitting for about three hours up there in the complete dark. It was cold, it was miserable, and also, I couldn't see anything. I could just see a little bit of the rocks that I was sitting on. I had no idea what was around me. I was completely ignorant of what was around me. But then, the, the, the dark became dark blue and light blue and a pale yellow, and the, and the sun came up over the state line in Nevada, and everything lit up. All the mountains, there were hundreds of mountains around me that I had not seen before, and they lit up in this brilliant deep red. I wish you all could have been there. But the sunrise, this picture of the sunrise from going from utter darkness, not knowing what's around you, being miserable, and then the light shining on you, it is truly a picture of what God has done for us in Christ. And so remember that as we go through this sermon, it is like a sunrise. It is like going from darkness to light. So first of all, our first main point is this, the Christian's dark past. The Christian's dark past past. If you look at verse 13, Paul writes that Christians or the Colossians have been delivered from the domain of darkness. Let's unpack that phrase. The word domain refers to the sphere in which power is exercised. If you look at other translations besides the ESV, which I read from, they put this as the dominion of darkness or maybe the power of darkness or the authority of darkness. And the Bible often uses the imagery of darkness to describe sin and the works of Satan. And so, under this point, we will look at some characteristics of the domain of darkness. We must understand as Christians what we have been saved from in order to rightly understand what we have been saved to. For the Christian, the domain of darkness is their dark past. But if you're here and you're outside of Christ, this is your sad present. So listen as I describe the domain of darkness. First of all, the first sub-point, if you will, is that Satan rules the domain of darkness. Satan rules the domain of darkness. When we survey this domain of darkness, we see it is ruled by an evil manipulative, and a horrifying dictator. You could take all the worst dictators in human history, put them all together, and Satan is worse than all of them. Satan and all his fallen angels who rebelled against God at the first, he has much power and much authority here on earth. Now, we must say that this power is checked and permitted He and all his fallen angels are under the sovereign power of God. They are not infinite. They are not all-powerful. They are limited. They are finite. But for a time, Satan rules his dark domain until the end of all things when he will be utterly defeated. But until that time, Satan has great power over unbelievers. Well, where in the Bible, other than Colossians 1, do we see it's speaking of Satan as having this power, of wielding such power and influence over unbelievers. There are many places, but here are a few for your consideration. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul mentions the prince of the power or the domain of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Satan is the prince of the power, he's prince of the domain of the air, and he is at work in the sons of disobedience. He's at work in unbelievers. We also see in Ephesians 6, Paul mentions that cosmic powers that are over this present darkness. And we also see in the temptation of Jesus, 
Remember that Satan takes Jesus up onto a very high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And then he offers this domain, it's the same word in the Greek, to Jesus. If Jesus what, would fall down and worship him. We know that Jesus did not. But this shows that Satan has a large measure of power, even over the nations of our world. And now in Colossians chapter 1, the fact that Paul speaks of the domain of darkness, the authority or power of darkness, shows that Satan exerts power and control over fallen mankind. And this power is exerted over individuals as well, causing them to be blind to spiritual truths. Remember how I was up on Mount Whitney and it was dark and I was ignorant of what was around me. Such is the lot of an unbeliever. Ignorance and darkness go hand in hand. The Apostle John uses the imagery of darkness a lot in his, in his, epistle, uh, his epistles and his gospel to speak of ignorance, of being blind to spiritual truths. Satan wants his subjects to be blind and miserable. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, wrote, Satan is a merciless tyrant who sports in the damnation of souls. He sports in the damnation of souls. And this is what Paul speaks of in Romans 1, verses 21 to 23. He talks about how fallen mankind did not, they knew God, but did not honor him. And Paul says that they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The same imagery. Satan loves to blind mankind, to leave them in ignorance. This is the domain of darkness. This is what it's like. And men love the darkness. They love it as they are being controlled by it. And Paul talks about this progression away from God, away from the truth, and away from the light towards the darkness. And what does it lead to, as he talks about in Romans 1? To the creation of idols, to exchanging the glory of God for mortal things. And he even says that it leads to the dishonoring of their bodies through impurity. And he says this leads specifically to homosexuality. To the degree that humanity in, under the domain of darkness has moved away from God and away from the light, the darker and darker it will become. We could look at history and survey all the empires and the societies and cultures and we could see lots of darkness. We could see many pagan and, and horrific cultures that did things. But friends, we could look at our own land where many of these horrific things are coming back into popularity but we see that the power of darkness that is exerted over unbelievers is very real. And we must realize that Satan himself is its ruler. That's the first point, that Satan rules the domain of darkness. Number two, the second thing about this domain of darkness is that humanity is born under the domain of darkness. Humanity is born under the domain of darkness. How do you enter the domain of darkness? How do you come under its power? It comes with birth into this world. See the great tragedy of Adam, our first parent, and his fall. He is our covenant head, and he stood in the stead of all mankind. And through his sin, which included listening to the lies of Satan and rejecting the truth of God, we are now conceived in sin. We are, by nature, children of wrath, as Paul says. We are subjects of death. And that's a hard pill to swallow for many. But it's clear from the pages of Scripture, and I would argue even our common experience, that we are all born in sin, born under the domain of darkness. Mankind is not born in the light. Mankind is born in the darkness. This is how we entered this domain of darkness. Here are three verses for your consideration Showing this, in Romans 5, 12, Paul says, Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. This is the doctrine of original sin, which simply means that we receive a sin nature from Adam. He is our federal head, or our covenant head, even before we made any decisions of our own. Or we could look at Psalm 51, 5, when David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Or we could look at Ephesians 2, 3, which I mentioned, where Paul says that you were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. To understand the severity 
and the terrible nature of the domain of darkness, we need to understand how we entered it. And this is explained in scripture as the result of Adam, our federal head, sinning in the garden. And the statement of Paul in Romans 3 that none are righteous, no, not one, is because in Adam's sin, all mankind lost their original righteousness and had Adam's sin nature imputed to them. This is the sad and sorry lot of mankind. The third thing to know about the domain of darkness is very serious. And that is the end of the domain of darkness is hell. The end of the domain of darkness is hell. The domain of darkness is not just a sickness. It is not just something that is to be suffered through for a season or a long time or even just this life. Those who die while under the domain of darkness are cast into hell, where they remain in torment and utter darkness. And you might ask, why do we have to talk about hell? Well, Jesus talked about hell, in fact, more than anyone else in Scripture. See how Jesus refers to hell. He refers to it as the outer darkness three times, where he says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He refers to hell as a fiery furnace where lawbreakers will be thrown. He refers to it as eternal fire, unquenchable fire, and eternal punishment. This is the end of the domain of darkness, my dear friends. It ends in hell. This is the, this is the bitter but the truth that you need to hear. This is Satan's great aim to keep as many souls as he can away from the light and in the darkness so that they would be cast into hell to join him in his misery. Remember what Watson said. He sports in the damnation of souls. And not only will unbelievers be cast into hell, but they will be reserved for judgment at the end of all things when Jesus Christ will raise the wicked for dishonor. They will be able to experience a resurrection but with bodies prepared for everlasting torment. They will appear before the throne of Jesus Christ and they will give account for everything they have said and everything that they have done in their lives. And they will go away. They will be cast into what is called the lake of fire. This is the terminus of the domain of darkness. This is the horror to which it leads. If you are outside of Christ this morning, you need to realize that you are under the power of darkness. Your master is Satan himself. The state of sin in which you exist is the law of all mankind because of Adam's sin as our covenant head. And the trajectory of your life leads downwards to hell and everlasting torment. And I hope this wakes you up to the serious danger that you are in. There is no neutrality in this world. You are either in the domain of darkness or you are in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. There is no middle ground. And to Christians here, let me give you an illustration. Imagine a Jewish prisoner in the Holocaust in a concentration camp, surrounded by death and evil and deplorable cruelty. And then imagine this prisoner being freed from that darkness and falling to his knees and saying, thank you, thank you for saving me. Could you imagine that, that man forgetting the evil that he saw? Could you imagine him even in his head thinking about going back? No, never, never again would I go back to that horror. And so it is with us, dear brothers and sisters. We must view what we have been saved from in its true and its bitter light. We must accurately understand the domain of darkness and its terrible tyrant to warn us of its exceeding Horror, just like that Holocaust survivor saying, I will never go back. We as Christians must have the same hatred of the works of the enemy. We must have the same intense hatred of the domain of darkness. We must say to ourselves, never again. But friends, don't we find ourselves sometimes flirting with the domain of darkness? We're tempted by pleasure or money or popularity. Christian, beware. Remember well that the domain of darkness is ruled by an evil master, Satan himself, and it leads to hell. Well, we have spent enough time in the darkness. We will now move to the sunrise, to the beauty of Jesus Christ who has delivered Christians from this domain of darkness. 
Consider with me in the second place, the Christian's bright present. The Christian's bright present. The whole purpose of Paul mentioning the domain of darkness is to encourage the Colossians that they have been delivered. They have been rescued from this domain of darkness. He writes, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. And notice a few things under this point. Notice a few things. The first, the first sub-point is this. The divine sovereignty of this deliverance. The divine sovereignty of this deliverance. I hope you see in painting such a dark picture of the domain of darkness, of the state of sin, of being an unbeliever, even a picture of our past, brothers and sisters, it is clear that we needed to be delivered. We needed a great deliverance to escape such evil and such darkness. We could not save ourselves from that mess. We could not overcome the darkness by our own and find the light. Those who are lost in the darkness are in need of divine deliverance. They need the sovereign power of God to lift them up and to take them out of the darkness. That is the only way that they could be delivered. And notice that Paul here speaks, he's been speaking to the Colossians as you, the second person, and now he switches to us. He includes himself in here, that we have been delivered from the domain of darkness. And I think that Paul here is drawing upon his own life experience. Remember on the road to Damascus that Paul's life was changed forever. He went from being a servant of the darkness who was hunting the light to being the greatest general of the light that this world has ever seen. There on that road, Paul literally was blinded. He was in the darkness. He was groping around in the dark, and Jesus spoke to him. And then later, he received his sight from the brother Ananias. You could say that Paul went from spiritual and physical darkness to physical and spiritual light. In Acts 26, Paul is speaking to King Agrippa about his conversion, and he, he tells a little bit more detail of what Jesus said to him. Jesus said to Paul on the road to Damascus, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to open there the Gentiles' eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. You see, Paul knew what it meant personally, what it meant to be delivered from darkness and to be brought into the light. His life was changed forever, and his mission was to go out into the darkness and to preach the light of Jesus Christ to all those who were still in the dark. But dear friends, the same sovereign power that saved the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, the same sovereign power that saved the Colossians from their spiritual slavery, that's the same sovereign power that saved a 15-year-old boy who was sitting and listening to a sermon at a beach camp. And that boy, he looked like a Christian and he sounded like a Christian. He could say all the Sunday school answers, but he was deeply self-righteous. But it was the sovereign power of God that saved me brothers and sisters. The sovereign power of God changed my life forever. He delivered me, and it was all of God. And it is the same sovereign power that has saved every single one of you, brothers and sisters. He has delivered you from the domain of darkness. This was not of your own. This was him. This was all of grace. And this should really just stir up humility in our hearts and thankfulness. Or to say with Paul in Romans 11, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. And one last thing to note here. For all the power that Satan has over the darkness and over unbelievers, he is completely powerless. He is totally unable to stop the sovereign power of God in drawing one of his elect to himself. Satan can do nothing. He has no power to stop God saving sinners. That is such an encouraging thought. And that should encourage our evangelism, brothers and sisters. There is no power on earth that can stop the gospel from going forth, from God drawing one of his own to himself. To himself. Well, we've seen the divine sovereignty of this deliverance. Let us notice in the second place, the second sub-point here, the terrible price of this deliverance. 
the terrible price of this deliverance. We have mentioned that that God and his sovereign power has delivered us, but how exactly has God done this? How has God delivered us? By what means has God the Father achieved our salvation? Well, it was by sending his Son into the domain of darkness, to live among the darkness, to never be controlled or influenced or tainted by the darkness, and God the Son incarnate, He would die a gruesome death to redeem and forgive his people. And so let us consider for a moment the terrible price of our deliverance. And Paul describes the means by which we have been delivered. Look at verse 14. He says, speaking of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus Christ, we have redemption. What's redemption? Well, the word means to buy back or to release from captivity or slavery by paying a price. And this word has a rich Old Testament background, especially in the the, the fact that God redeemed Israel, the people of Israel, from slavery in the land of Egypt. Israel was rescued and delivered, redeemed from Israel. But if you remember, that came at a price. What was the price of Israel's redemption It was the death of the firstborn sons. And in this way, the Passover celebrated this deliverance, this redemption. And for the Colossians, they also would have, they lived in the context of slavery. They would have understand what it meant to be freed from slavery at a price. And they would understand that they were released from spiritual slavery. They were redeemed from the domain of darkness. And this redemption, Paul says, includes the forgiveness of sins. Not only are you taken out of that terrible domain of darkness, but your sins are forgiven. That is the beauty of the gospel, what Jesus has done for us. But we need to ask, how could we be redeemed? How could our sins be forgiven? How could a holy God look on us, those who were born sinful, who followed our master Satan, who hated God, we worshiped idols instead of him? You see, in a universe where a holy God and wicked sinners coexist, there will be a collision. A holy God cannot deny himself. A holy God cannot overlook or ignore sin or sweep sin under the carpet. A holy God cannot forgive our sin without satisfying divine justice. And just as in the Exodus, when the people of Israel were delivered by a price, the death of the firstborn sons, so God the Father has sent and given his only begotten son as the payment for our redemption. And so here we come to the terrible price of our deliverance. Here we come to Redemption's Hill. Here we come to the cross of Christ. God chose to redeem us in a very specific way, by God the Son dying as a man in our stead. The one who is impassable, the one who cannot suffer, united himself with a human nature that could suffer and how he did suffer on that cross. Look and see, my friends, his hands and his feet pierced with thorns. Look and see his head pierced with a crown of thorns. Look and see the shame and the nakedness and the scandal of the cross. But realize that what happened upon that cross was not just merely a man dying. Jesus Christ took upon himself the full weight of, of the sins of all of his people upon himself. This is how he has redeemed us. This is how we have been set free from the domain of darkness. This is how we were rescued from hell. For Jesus faced hell for us on the cross, and he drained to the very last drop the wrath of God. This is what we call satisfaction. He has satisfied the wrath of God that was against us. Truly, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.20, you were bought with a price. Or Paul says in in Acts 20.28 that the church was obtained with his own blood. When we consider our salvation, when we consider our deliverance from the domain of darkness, never forget the blood-stained cross. And sinner, you who are outside of Christ this morning, have you been listening? You are a slave in the domain of darkness, 
but see the wonderful salvation that is offered you on the cross of Christ. See the Savior beckon to you and say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God's word promises that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. So come unto the Savior this morning, my friend, and be saved. The third thing to note about the Christian's bright present is the blessings of the kingdom of Christ. The blessings of the kingdom of Christ. I have spoken a lot about what we have been saved from and now how we have been saved, but let me mention what we have been saved to. We have, and in Paul's words here, been transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Notice the word transferred. God has not just delivered us from darkness, but he has transferred us. Or I like how the King James says, translated us. The word was used in the ancient world sometimes to refer to the wholesale deportation of peoples. A king would conquer a foreign land and take up all the citizens of that place and take them back to his land. And this is in the very similar way, in the very same sense in which God has rescued us and transferred us from the domain of darkness. He has taken us to himself, to his own kingdom, to the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. And consider the fact that the kingdom we are taken to is of his beloved son, or the son of his love. Why is the kingdom to be said, uh, why is the kingdom said to be of the son, or of his beloved son? Because no man can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. No one can be accepted by God unless they come through Christ. He is the beloved Son. It's the same title that's used at Jesus' baptism and at his transfiguration. This is the love between God the Father and God the Son. And this is what our salvation is based on. We enter into his kingdom because of that love. Now, time constraints. I would love to speak to you all this morning of all the blessings of the new covenant, but we simply don't have much time. Let me briefly review for you some of what you have in Christ. You have a union with Christ. This covenantal and mystical union with Christ is the basis for all the blessings that I will speak of in a second. We are in Christ. We are in him. We have regeneration. We are born again by the Spirit. We are given a new nature. We have justification. We are declared righteous in God's sight. Remember that in Adam, we received by imputation his unrighteousness. Now in the second Adam, in Jesus Christ, we receive his perfect righteousness. We are declared righteous in God's sight because of Christ. We have sanctification. The Holy Spirit works in and through us to conform us into the image of Christ. And we also have adoption. We're adopted. We are children of God. We can call God our Father because we have the spirit of adoption. And I could speak many, many more minutes upon the blessings of the new covenant. But do you see here the sufficiency of Christ? He has died for us, and in him we have everything we need. We need nothing else. We need nothing else. And the Colossians, who were tempted to look to other things to complete their salvation, needed to hear this. And so do we. We need nothing besides Christ to be accepted by God. Well, in the final point, the final point of our sermon, number three, consider the Christian's brilliant future. The Christian's brilliant future. We've talked about the Christian's dark past We've talked about the Christian's bright present. The sun has risen. We've been looking at the beauty of the sunrise. We've been taken from the dark, and now we see the light of the gospel. But Christians come further up and further in. There's more here. There's more awaiting us. Consider the Christian's brilliant future. I don't mean uh, extremely intelligent. I mean radiant, extremely bright, brilliant future. Look back at verse 12. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. This is the Christian's brilliant future. The God the Father has qualified us to partake of everlasting life. 
Uh, the word qualify, he has qualified us, it means to make sufficient. Um, for example, if you qualify for the Olympics, you have earned a spot to compete in the Olympics. Well, God has qualified us for a spot in heaven, a share in heaven. This is not because we earned it, but because our Savior did. The Father looks upon all those who the Son died for and says, qualified, qualified, qualified. You are qualified for eternal life. And in a certain sense, we are qualified now for eternal life. This verb is in the past tense, qualified. But we have not received the full inheritance that awaits Christians yet. And this is what we speak of by, or what Paul speaks of by saying the inheritance of the saints in light. That's a beautiful phrase, by the way, the, the saints in light. But look at the word inheritance. It has the basic meaning of, of a lot or a share. And one looks back to the 12 tribes of Israel. They're about to enter the land of Canaan, and they're each given an inheritance, an allotment, a place in Canaan where they can dwell and live and build their cities. But in Christ, the people of God are given an inheritance in the heavenly Canaan. And this is much greater than what was just dirt, which was given to the, Isra the, to the Is Israelites. Christians share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And this is contrasted with what she said in, about darkness in just the next verse. We have gone from the utter pitch black of darkness past the sunrise, and now to the eternal day. The sun has risen, and it will never set. It is at high noon for all eternity. This is the Christian's brilliant future. We will behold the glory of the one who dwells in unapproachable light. That is our future, brothers and sisters who are in Christ. Can you imagine it? <laughs> no, we can't. It is unimaginable, but it is amazing. You might wonder, though, about our deaths. That seems like a kind of darkness, doesn't it? From our perspective, death may be a difficult and a fearful and a dark road. But when we put it in perspective, it ends up just being a small cloud blocking the sun, blocking from our perspective what is the glorious sunlight of God. For when we die, we go to be with the Lord. We see him face to face. That is our future. And this happens first when we die. Our souls are separated from our bodies and we go to be with the Lord immediately, as Paul says. This is the intermediate state. This is a joyous and a wonderful thing. But that is still not the complete inheritance of the saints in light. On the last day, the bodies of the wicked, remember, are raised for judgment. But the bodies of the righteous are raised for eternal glory. We know from Revelation 21, which describes the new heavens and new earth, that there's a light in heaven. But that light is not from the sun or from the moon or from a light or a lamp. It says, for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. We await an inheritance with the saints in light. Can't you wait to die and to go be with the Lord? Can't you wait for the second coming of Christ? This is something that we should be excited about. We should not dread this. We should look forward to this with all our energy and all our being. An unbeliever, do you see the goodness in heaven? Contrast this with the domain of darkness that you are in. Do you desire heaven? Do you desire to be one with God? Well, flee from your sins. Look to Jesus Christ, place all your hope in his hands, and you will be saved. In conclusion, where does this leave us? Paul, in powerful and clear words, has described the majestic power of God, sovereignly rescuing us and delivering us from darkness, transferring us to light, qualifying us for eternal life. But we need to remember why Paul felt the need to describe to the Colossians the gospel in such clear and straightforward languages. language. Recall that they were faced with that false teaching that deceptively tried to add things to the gospel. Paul has shown to them the sufficiency of Christ's work. They need nothing else to qualify them for salvation, only Christ. And so 
we as well, who are not exempt from this problem of trying to add things to Christ, add things to the gospel, we need to read this verse and preach these verses to ourselves that he has delivered us from darkness and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son that we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. And let me end with a word to those of you who are unbelievers, which there are some here this morning. Listen to these words from Spurgeon. He says this, If God has delivered us, why should he not deliver you? Why some of us who have been delivered seemed very unlikely ever to be delivered. We did not want to be. We loved darkness rather than light, and yet he delivered us from it. We were, some of us, very hard-hearted. Some of us had plunged very deep into sin. There are some here who are wonders of divine grace. They were once wonders of sin, and yet the love of God looked them up and brought them out, fetched them from the bar, fetched them out of the theater, brought them even from the brothel, and washed and cleansed them, and made them sit among God's people and love his ways and rejoice in his dear name. And why should God not do the same with you? Spurgeon says, I know 20 reasons why he should not, but I will tell you one. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And so please realize, dear friend, all of us here who are Christians, we are nothing special. There's nothing special about us. We were great sinners. We were in the darkness. We loved the darkness. We hated God, but he delivered us. He rescued us. He plucked us out of darkness and brought us into the light. The only thing that is special about us is God's grace. And now we love to be among God's people. We love to hear the singing and the preaching and the reading of his word. We love to hear the story of the gospel over and over again because it's our story. We have been delivered and we have been rescued. And I pray this morning that you would see the beauty of Jesus Christ and come to him. He will not cast you out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have delivered us from the domain of darkness. Lord, this was not by our own power or might or intelligence or wisdom, but you saved us. You plucked us out of that horrible and dark place. You rescued us from the power and control of Satan. Lord, we are so thankful. We fall to our knees And we thank you for your grace in our lives. And we thank you for the unimaginable glories of Christ that we have now and the future, the brilliant future that awaits us in heaven. Lord, may this encourage us. May we never look to anyone else or anything else but to Christ. He is sufficient. He is enough for us. And Lord, I pray for those here who are outside of Christ that they would see aright and truly and accurately the terrible nature of, of their state of sin that they live in, that they would see their need, but that they would look to the Savior, that they would look to the blood-stained cross, and that they would come and that they would be saved. Dude, Lord, would you do a great work of salvation here this morning? Revive our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.